everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to extraordinary people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guests have been on the show before, their kids have been on, and they truly are extraordinary, and so is their work, but so is their new book. You have to pick up a copy of this. It's called The 30-Day Alzheimer's Solution. If nothing else, just for the beautiful photos and, and recipes, which we'll show throughout the show. But they're here today to talk about something called the Neuro9. They are Team Shirzai, Dr. Aisha and Dr. Dean Shirzai. Welcome them back to the show. It's so great to see you. And the book is already doing well. I watched it. So thank you. So congratulations on the early success. That's so kind of thank you. you. Thank you so much for having us again. We're so excited to be here with you, with the audience and talk about something that we're really passionate about, you know, brain health. Yeah. I know I listened to a bunch of podcasts with you, you know, just to prepare for the show because it's easier for me to listen than to read. And and I believe uh, Dr. Dean, you said something like every 64 seconds, somebody has a stroke. That's like, since we started one person. Yeah, every every 64 seconds. And that's an underestimate uh, that somebody's being diagnosed with Alzheimer's, uh, which is a major type of dementia. And in a lot of communities, people develop dementia and it's never reported. So it's uh, the, the fastest growing epidemic <clears throat> in the West, and we have to be aware of it. We have to do whatever we can in our communities and homes to forestall it. So the purpose of this whole thing that we're doing was just that. And ahead of time, I want to say something very important. Everything we do, everything, not just this book, but every, our work and everything else is dedicated to Healthy Minds Initiative, which is a non-for-profit. Its aim is to raise awareness about brain health. So this is not for self-aggrandizement or monetary gain. It's to make a, to have a movement for brain health. That's basically the whole premise. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we don't even, I mean, I, I don't, can't speak for everyone, but we don't think about our brains until they go wrong. For example, we go to the dentist every six months usually, and a lot of people go to the eye doctor every year, even people that maybe don't wear glasses. And a lot of times people go to the dermatologist once a year for a skin check or a physical, but nobody gets their brain assessed or checked until something goes wrong. Yeah, yeah, that is unfortunate. And, you know, for for years and decades, uh, people used to think that the brain was, you know, an organ that couldn't really be affected. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this with you in the past as well. The brain is just like any other organ, just like your heart, your kidney, your your liver, and whatever you do every day, what you eat and how you move and how you engage, it affects your brain. And uh, we think kind of selfishly that the brain is the most important organ in the body because it's your personality, it's your decisions, it's how you feel about yourself and everybody else. So we should definitely take care of it. And it's not as difficult as people think it is. Right. So how do we take care of our brain? How do we build a better brain? And <clears throat> It's with eating this cake. <laughs> yes. Sign me up. If this is how to do it, I'll do it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, the yeah. reason for the uh, the cake on the cover <clears throat> is so that people don't, you know, whenever they think about healthy food, they think about deprivation. Eating healthy is not deprivation. It's actually the opposite because you open up to so much variety of food and so much health, so healthy. Yeah. And most importantly, it can be tasty. And, and Aisha, when she was uh, doing her fellowship at Columbia University, um, she would be going back and forth. I would be with the kids in, in Los Angeles and Aisha would be in New York and we'd fly back and forth every two weeks. In the mornings, she would be in the ICU and at night she would be in cooking school. Yeah. yeah. And, and the reason was, if all we did was say, you have stroke and here's an aspirin, see you later, it would be a disservice. By the way, we're not against medicine. We're very pro-medicine. We're pro-science. Uh, all those things are amazing. But we think that there should be a little bit more shift maybe a 70% shift towards prevention. Yeah. And that's what is not done in healthcare. Yeah. Um, and our goal is to actually just do that. The brain is incredibly resilient, but it needs some help. And we're in, instead of helping it, what we're doing with our modern life, be it food, lack of movement, stress, and lack of sleep, we're actually putting it under such strain which, is, which means that it's actually aging our brain rapidly. There are studies that show that even changing your diet alone changes your age, brain age, by seven years or more. Yeah. Yeah. They've seen that through neuropsychological testing and by imaging. Seven years or more by just simply changing your diet a few years. Mm -hmm. Imagine even longer. 
So we're, we're, we're excited about bringing this into people's homes. And food is a very important aspect of brain health, as is for general health. Um, unfortunately, it's not really talked about because people think that changing your diet or your dietary pattern is very difficult. Unfortunately, we're not doing very well as far as, um, you know, our nation, national scores are concerned. You know, there was a report by the American Heart Association. It comes out every year and it says that less than 0.5% of adults actually eat a healthy diet. And the kind of diet that they talk about is the one that has been assigned by the American Heart Association, which we think, you and I, Chef AJ, we don't think that's optimal at all. So even by their standards, people are actually not eating healthy. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done and you know what you're doing on your platform and what we're trying to do dispersing this message is very very important because 80 to 90 percent of chronic diseases of aging especially brain aging like alzheimer's like stroke and like parkinson's can be prevented it's well if you get to eat food that looks like this <laughs> and yeah. look like food that looks like you. this i think it'd be pretty easy I, I think i love that you're not just a doctor but you're a chef I, you know, I, I think um, I think it's very, very important for us to have that spectrum, right? We, as physicians, we're trained and, you know, physicians are great people, but we're always trained to meet people at the stage where it's kind of too late, where they already have had a disease. You know, they come to the emergency room with half of their body not moving, or they come to the clinic and they don't have uh, control over their memories or their brain function. But if we can meet people in their communities, at their homes, and disperse this message that these diseases are preventable, then I think we've done our job. And so, yeah, very, very passionate about food and cooking. That's why I would be in the ICU in the morning and I would be cutting vegetables at night, just getting myself equipped with all that knowledge of how food can be healthy, easy to make, and of course, delicious. There's there are more than 75 recipes in that book. And uh, we had an, um, one of the world renowned photographers, as you yeah, saw the pictures. Yeah, we're so lucky <clears> to have a great team. Come here from San Francisco and take the picture for a week. And the reason is because we think it's that important. The book is in three parts. One is the basic science. And you saw the first part, not long winded, but really concise science about, you know, when they say B12 deficiency or, or omega-3 or so on. And so on. We talked about each of those, but in really nice chunks of information and validated and, and referenced as far as science is concerned. The second part is the, the, the recipes, which is amazing recipes. And the third part is behavior. We're behavioral neurologists and my whole training for, for decades has been on behavior. How do you, okay, it's great to tell people to eat cruciferous vegetables, but how do you change behavior so it becomes habit, that it becomes personality and character, and then the family becomes culture, and then the community becomes a movement? Mm -hmm. That's what we think differentiates us. We have the largest brain health initiative in the world right now, where we're doing research and we're moving in beach cities. We just started a um, one of the largest initiatives in the uh, African-American uh, faith-based communities. We have a statewide Arizona movement, as well as another one starting in New York, because if we can implement it at the community levels, then we will truly make difference. So that's that's the impetus behind the book is just that. How, how do people get involved with your Healthy Brain Initiative? They can, uh, they can, well, we, we're very active on social media. We have a website called healthymindsinitiative.org and we're Healthy Minds Initiative on social media. We have, uh, Pre-pandemic, we would travel quite a lot, go to different communities, have conversations. But since then, we've created a very strong digital platform where we connect with community members. We train individuals as brain health ambassadors in their communities. And we have several projects that are going on, one in Sedona, in Northern Arizona, and other places as well. Um, here's a, a little bit of a, a thing that we've added to the book. So the book is not just a book. <clears throat> with the book comes an app. Uh, it's called Neuro Plan App, <clears throat> but for people who pre-order, but just today we extended it till uh, end of the month. Um, until the end of the month, people who get the book, they can actually join a group on, on Facebook and we're hoping to have it outside of Facebook as well, where for a month on a daily basis, Aisha and I will go through the whole process with them with a focus on behavior and habit creation. Right. We'll have a Harvard trained sleep doctor, Oxford trained stress management doctor, two behavioral specialists, yeah. three nutritionists, 
a registered then, dietitian registered dietitian yeah. uh, going through this with them for one month mm -hmm. so for those people who get the book until the 30th please uh, contact us and, and the chef will give you um <clears throat> all the information i've been losing my voice these days <laughs> for the talking topic. a lot but yeah so for already we have several thousand people that have added mm -hmm. we're giving them the downloadables information and then on april 5th for one month they'll be going through this with cognitive tools cognitive assessment i mean it's big, basically the biggest brain study ever done uh we're expecting about seven thousand people or more uh, but uh, we're very excited about that. So the book right. comes with that. And it's for free. People don't really oh, have yeah. to pay anything for it. So the chat's blowing up, but you'll give me that information. I can put it in the show notes so that I don't get a million emails. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, it's yes. it's right. on our website, sharesimd.com. And when people go there, they'll get all that information about this, this bonus that we've created that comes along when people pre-order or order the book, not pre-order yeah. anymore because it's out today. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Today's the first day and it was all, it's already, it was doing well even yesterday. So that just shows how much Thank people you. love you. So that's great. I'll get that information. So the Neuro9, I've never heard you talk about that before, but I love yes. things that have numbers. So <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we're, um, when you look at the data and the research that has come to us for <clears> years <throat> and decades about brain health and what kinds of foods are, are good for the brain, you know, we always talk about the importance of including whole food, plant-based diet. The whole food, plant-based diet is the optimal diet for the brain, whether it's the Mediterranean diet or the MIND diet or the DASH diet, whatever dietary pattern you see. And not to sound too much of a reductionist, we don't believe in, you know, like a food being good for the brain, but even in the, in the science and the research, when they've done analysis of different dietary patterns, there are certain foods that stand out as far as their neuroprotective effect is concerned. So we basically term those foods as neuro nine. And these are nine foods that if you include on a daily basis in your meals, the chances of one having neurodegenerative diseases of the brain like Alzheimer's uh, or neurovascular ones like stroke is very, very low. And so we kind of got uh, some samples of these foods right here in front of us and the neuro nine is included in our book. Um, it's actually on page nine of the book. And so, you know, just to kind of go through the, the list of those nine foods, the first one, maybe should, I'll do it I'm, out of memory. I'm testing your memory. Yes. I'll do it out of memory because, you know, brain <clears> health. <throat> so the, the first food that is incredibly healthy, and I think, Chef AJ, you would agree with this, are greens. Yes. Greens are probably the healthiest foods in the world because they are packed with fiber, phytonutrients, different minerals and vitamins that are good for our mind, for our gut health. And if you include greens in your daily meals, uh, the chances of Alzheimer's disease is reduced significantly. And this has been studied in multiple databases in the Women's Health Initiative, in the Northern Manhattan study, et cetera, et cetera, in the Fam Framingham study as well. Um, and you know, the, the darker, the better. So green leafy vegetables like Swiss chards or, um, uh, let's Colored say spinach greens. or collard greens. I, mean, I have some lettuce and some spring mix here, uh, but you know, whatever green that people can get, lettuce even is is great. And there's so many easy and wonderful ways to mix greens to our foods. We can have a salad, but you don't necessarily have to have a salad if you don't want to. You can steam the greens, mix it with some brown rice, with some quinoa. You can mix it into a smoothie. You can actually bake. We actually bake kale on a low temperature with a little bit of nutritional yeast and maybe some paprika, and you can have kale chips. It's like the best snack ever. Um, so there are many ways to, to actually prepare it. So that's green. And then the second one are beans. Beans are lentils, legumes are incredible sources of complex carbohydrates. I have some red lentils here. And again, clean sources of plant-based proteins that don't harm our brain. Everybody keeps talking about protein, 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 but what about protein if you're on a plant-based diet? Nobody thinks about the fact that we're not getting enough fiber. And here's a phenomenal source of fiber, clean protein, complex carbohydrates that feeds our gut bacteria, that provides glucose, which is the preferred fuel for the brain in a beautiful way, in a synergistic way, along with the fiber. See, everybody, you know, people who are concerned about carbohydrates, you know, people who talk about low carb, they don't understand that there's a big difference between beans and a donut. 
Yes, they might have carbohydrates, but one is simple carbohydrate that rushes into the circulation and causes damage to the brain. And the other one is complex carbohydrates that are released in a beautiful, slow way. And this is essentially fuel for the brain. This is what the brain needs. So beans are excellent. We're not against canned uh, beans, but making sure that they don't have salt because salt is the biggest enemy for blood pressure, for vascular health. So if you can get canned beans, um, that have no salt like this one that I have is phenomenal. And these are handy. You can keep them in your pantry and use them whenever you want. <clears throat> and for those who've read this whole crazy other book that said, talks about le le lectins, oh. don't have to worry about lectins. Yeah. It's, it's a ridiculous concept. Um, they're, it's, they're real, but they're not at all a threat to us. Uh, in fact, the opposite, the foods that have the highest lectins, which are beans are also the healthiest. In fact, in blue zone, which are the our friends uh, the, our friend uh, Dan Butner has identified as the healthiest places and we are working in the only blue zone in the United States Loma Linda the one common denominator is beans yeah. so beans are incredibly healthy it's a cornerstone of of uh, a diet for longevity uh, we have a lot of recipes with lots of chickpeas beans lentils all kinds of things it's it's one of the most important foods that we as family eat all the time okay the third one is let's say cruciferous vegetables. All right, so cruciferous are a group of uh, vegetables uh, that include things like broccoli, mm -hmm. cauliflower, kale, arugula, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. These are all cruciferous and they're so, so healthy for the brain. Uh, broccoli specifically has a compound called sulforaphane. And now sulforaphane uh, gets activated in, in our mouth when we chew broccoli, or even when you cut broccoli and leave it for a couple of hours uh, on the table, it actually activates sulforaphane. And it is amazing for the vasculature for our blood vessels. And it's a very potent antioxidant. And the brain being such an active organ, you know, working so hard, creating so many byproducts, sulforaphane and the compounds in cruciferous vegetables actually deactivate them. So including these foods in our daily meals um, should it, it should be it should be a habit for all of us. Again, depending on what you like, we love cauliflower. I mean, we eat cauliflower, rice cauliflower all the time. We bake them. We even just mash them as, you know, and mix it with some potatoes as, as cauli mashed potatoes. Um, and, and that's the kid's favorite meal. It I is, think, isn't it? it is absolutely. All right. And then, okay, so I've done three so far, yeah. right? And then the fourth one is seeds. Now seeds like chia seeds and flax seeds, ground flax seeds, or sometimes hemp seeds are important sources of plant-based omega-3 fatty acids. Dean mentioned something earlier. The only type of fat that the brain needs is omega-3 fatty acids. You may have heard this from a lot of so-called influencers online who say, you know what? The brain is made up of fat and you need fat. You should eat fat because it needs it. That is such a false statement and it makes us so upset because the brain, yeah, the brain is made out of fat, but it's structural fat. There are no blobs of fat around your brain. The fat is embedded in the walls of the cells, in the coverings of their extensions, and it is replaced by the body. The liver makes enough cholesterol. We don't need saturated fats. As a matter of fact, saturated fat never even crosses the blood brain barrier, which is a very tight junction. If we eat a lot of fat, it actually damages the arteries in our brain. It causes microvascular disease, what we call white matter disease. Yeah, the brain is the most vascular organ in the body. And there are these pictures that you can actually look on, on the internet where they've denuded the brain of all the other tissue. And what you see is vascular tissue. And you look at that and you say, where was room for anything else? Where, you know, where does the other 87 billion neurons fit. and 10 times that glial cells, where did they fit? Uh, because it's so vascular. So if you're giving it saturated fat before, even if it gets to the neurons, it's going to damage all of the vasculature. Yeah. So the only fat we just did two reviews, one review, massive reviews, which we submitted for a publication. One is omega-3 and the developing brain and omega-3 and the aging brain. And the, though there are times in life where we have to be extra aware of our need for omega-3. Now we are, we should always be aware flax seeds, chia and all that. But the developing brain, where the brain is doubling every, you know, especially there are times where it's doubling in connections every few days, we need to be extra aware of omega-3 sources. We can't be magical. Uh, so, and, and then another time is uh, during pregnancy, lactation, and then as we get older, 
So we can do that by being by being extra aware of the food we're eating, as far as uh, chia and flaxseed and not, you know walnuts. But there's a little bit of more nuance because the trans. Well, if you're getting it just from plants, transition from ALA to EPA to DHA is a little complex. The enzyme is an overwhelmed, poor, overwhelmed enzyme that needs help because that enzyme is also being used in the omega-6 pathway. So the way to make it more efficient is lower your omega-6 content, which is processed foods and fatty foods, and then increase your omega-3, which is chia and flaxseed and, and walnuts. And also don't tax your liver. Mm -hmm. I think you, everybody in the audience knows what that means. Don't drink alcohol. No and alcohol. All that. Yeah. yeah. So by doing that, then you don't have to worry about it. But we're we're science based. We're not driven by thought leaders or you know gurus or anything. And we don't think anybody should hold us by that standard. Um, I was the director of research education for all of the university at Loma Linda, and I would tell my students that you should hold me accountable to the next word that comes out of me, not my past, my, not my five degrees, not none of that. The science must, must dictate the conversation. And the science says, if you're worried about not being able to get enough omega-3 during those periods, then sub supplement algae-based is fine. But other than that, you can actually get it from food, but you have to be extra aware of the, the relationship. That's basically the omega-3 story. Absolutely. Um, and algae-based, right? And algae -based, if, yeah. if anybody is at a point in their life where they need an extra boost than algae based ones. All right. So we talked about seeds and now let's talk about nuts. So nuts, um, you know, in multiple studies, again, it's the replacement of saturated fats with unsaturated fat that seems to be very important. So uh, nuts in small amounts, especially walnuts, um, you know, is, is very, is very good for the brain. Um, again, it has to be, people have to be careful because when, you know, when you hear nuts, you have to say how much and you know people who are concerned about their calories should be very careful but even you know a few walnuts to about you know a handful this is probably you know a little more than a handful is more than enough uh to include on your salads maybe in your dressings uh, or drizzle it or shred it on top of your pasta uh, it tastes really good and it's uh, that good kind of fat that the brain can enjoy and thrive on um, just to add a little bit of nuance to that as well if you're even worried about that, you can get the same amount of fat, uh, omega-3 from chia and flaxseed and all of that. Absolutely. So that's the critical thing. Absolutely. We are, the, what what creates chaos in the conversation is so oversimplification, binary, all or none. Life doesn't work like that. So there's nuance. And the nuance is just what we said. If you're worried about calories, if you're worried about fat, if you have end stage disease, mm -hmm. vascular disease, kidney disease, heart disease, brain disease, yeah, avoid fat altogether. But if not, small amounts, and when we're, we're, we're talking small, we were talking about small amounts, um, is fine. But in generality, those are the, 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 the nuance. Right. Okay. The next one is berries. Uh, I have some frozen berries here. We freeze our berries. Um, this is a combination of blackberries and blueberries. And berries are so, so healthy because, again, a uh, great source of antioxidants, anti-inflammatory agents. And there was a study uh, in the women's or the, the nurses' health study mm -hmm. where women <clears throat> who consumed at least half a cup of blueberries um, every day, they reduced their risk of Alzheimer's disease specifically to a great extent. And so, com you know, combining or having some uh, berries, whether it's on your oatmeal or I actually have a couple of recipes where I made a dressing out of blackberries, just mixed it with some apple cider vinegar and some herbs and spices. And it makes a beautiful dressing that can go on your um, on your grains. So including berries. And then we have our herbs and spices. Chef, I know you like herbs and spices. I have some turmeric, some paprika, some dried oregano, cumin, but you can you know get whatever you want. Pound for pound, these spices have a lot of anti-inflammatory um, agents in them that are very, very good. You can even make a, you know, a turmeric tea or turmeric latte with some oat milk or some almond milk. We, uh, sorry, let me, uh, so sure. we're, my worry when I was transitioning 17 years ago was salt. Mm. Um, <clears throat> everything I ate in Pittsburgh had salt. You know, I used to eat, Too much. Um, you know, I, 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 I played sports. So uh, beef jerky, meat seven times a day. So that's why another reason I hate the word moderation. You know, for somebody who eats meat seven times a day, what's moderation? Four times? Is that any better? So moderation is a meaningless term. 
identify the optimal and systematically work toward the optimal in a smart way. Smart is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound in a systematic way, work towards it. Um, but so salt is poison or salt is, yeah, we say in our recipes, uh, small amounts for taste, but, but, the, but we also talk about the science of salt. It's a major cause of high blood pressure and all of these things. Right. But as a replacement for salt, you have these amazing herbs and spices that take the negative and make it incredibly mm -hmm. positive. Yeah. <clears throat> there are four processes that usually, of course, you can break this down in different ways well, that we identify for brain health, inflammation, oxidation, lipid or fat dysregulation and glucose or sugar dysregulation. Uh, and um, herbs and spices seem to affect all of those processes. So we think these are, um, of course, I'm exaggerating, magical powders, but but they're great. They're amazing. All right. So I think we we're coming to the last one, right? And my brain is being challenged here. Um, and the last one that we included was tea. Um, tea, um, specifically green tea and herbal teas. I have some turmeric and ginger tea. I have some green tea. Uh, these are amazing. Uh, again, the catechins and some compounds that are in tea can be very, very helpful, and it can um, improve the vasculature and provide antioxidants and anti-inflammatory agents. Again, for people who are very sensitive to caffeine, though, they have to be very careful, and you get the same kind of anti-inflammatory agents from decaffeinated tea, so decaf green tea, decaf black tea. Um, of course, herbal teas are amazing, so including those are great. Um, caffeine can definitely <clears throat> affect blood pressure and people who have arrhythmias yeah. or normal heart anxiety or anxiety that can't really be good for them so yeah decaffeinated tea is wonderful sorry yeah so turmeric um I, again we we're very careful not to overstate um there's a lot of this thing going on that this is a magical this magic even this neuro nine we want to make sure that we put it in the appropriate weight don't think that you know, you can eat this and then go have your burgers and, you know, fries and fried food. No, it's it's as a replacement of those. And the totality of this is the which is beneficial. Turmeric, we just did a study that people can actually put in on go to Google Scholar or PubMed. Um, just this year published. Right. We were the main authors. But uh, of course, when we left Cedars, uh, uh, we're in the middle now. Um, it's um, uh, tur we use the curcumin, which is a byproduct of um, uh, a component of turmeric and gave it to people with mild cognitive impairment and looked at their retina and with special devices. And retina is a continuation of the brain. So amyloid protein, which is the bad protein in Alzheimer's accumulates in the back of the retina and you can see it. And when we gave them curcumin, it actually bound to the uh, uh, amyloid protein. Yeah. So of course we don't want to over extrapolate, but we think that means that it's going to bind and it's going to be removed. And, and, and there's some evidence of that as well. Of course, the indoor other evidence for curcumin and turmeric is that they're, we know that they're anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. So that's why they're great as well. Uh, again, we don't want to overstate these things, but there are definite patterns for all of these things being beneficial. That's right. And that's the neuro nine chef. I love it. And you know, what's great is like, it's, good for other diseases too. What's good for the brain is good for the heart. You know, with the first two things you said were beans and greens. Well, I think about people with diabetes, they tell them to eat beans and greens. So we don't need one diet for the brain or the heart or the kidney yeah. or the liver. We <clears throat> need a whole food plant based diet, preferably plant exclusive without all the salt and sugar and oil. And that, lots of questions about oil. We discussed before coming on, I, I just got one, another one came in. Is it necessary? It's we need the omega-3, but it doesn't have to come from oil, right? No, it no. doesn't have. No, it doesn't have to. A food can be healthy without oil. And especially for people who are concerned about their calorie intake, oil can be, you know, just way too much calories with no benefits at all. Um, also, you know, just based on some data, there was a time when we thought that oil could be harmful. As far as, you know, some types of oils are concerned, especially the extra virgin olive oil, the data that is coming to us now shows that it's not as unhealthy as once it was thought. But again, it's not a it's not an important component of our dietary pattern. So you don't have to add oil if you don't want to or if you have any concerns about the calorie intake. That's terrific. And it's the same thing with nuts. People can eat flax. That's that's adequate, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah.
Yeah. That's fantastic. So we've got some questions in the chat and here's a good one because I'm actually, I've been all born allergic to black pepper and mm -hmm. I know they talk about how black pepper activates turmeric and Tiffany's asking, is there anything besides black pepper that can activate turmeric? It, oh, interesting. It, it, it's not so much about activation as bioavailability. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, um, black pepper increases its bioavailability, but even without it, you can, you can have bioavailable, uh, for example, what we did in the cedars, uh, we didn't have uh, pepperin or black pepper as an added element, but but uh, you you just have to have increased amounts yeah. to to have the same availability. Right, and um, yeah, I, I, sometimes they say that if you add a little bit of you know unprocessed fat fatty foods, say for example, if you're going to add your turmeric to something, say you know uh, on top of your dressing, mixing it with a little bit of flaxseed might make it a little more bioavailable or maybe you know adding a one or two uh walnut pieces to that salad makes it more bioavailable so it, it also kind of binds to some of the unprocessed fats in dietary uh, patterns great i appreciate everything you're saying about brain and the fats because in and, and lectins and legumes because there is so much nutritional misinformation <clears throat> out there. and she, kathy who's watching live posted this before you started talking but she and this is and i'm not i'm not saying a lot of people think this and she said since not using any oil i'm concerned about not feeding the brain properly properly because oh. i heard that coconut oil is good for you oh, oh my, no my no. brain healthy and and the thing is is even if oil is good for you it that is not what's keeping the brain healthy not not at even all. close not a, is this kathy asking the question yeah kathy's yeah. saying no that. kathy i'm so sorry yeah that th 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 there's a lot of misinformation there's a lot of misinformation, especially coconut oil. It just started off, um, you know, when someone fed their husband some coconut oil and apparently that person had Alzheimer's and apparently got better, but we don't have any objective evidence. There is a consensus among scientists that coconut oil is unhealthy because it's more than 90% saturated fats. The brain essentially needs these micronutrients that we just talked about, whole grains, beans, greens, um, you know, berries, uh, spices, um, as far as the kind of fuel that it needs, it's, it's glucose. glucose yeah. Yeah. Uh, th there's been a false narrative being pushed, um, when it comes to whole food plant-based of deprivation right. or of loss, B12, um, uh, deficiency and iodine deficiency and all that. Remember choline? Choline. They made such a big deal about we, choline. We've actually made videos on all of these. And I mean, we're, when we went through the research, I yeah. mean, we're talking about reviews. And this is all false. Yes, you have to be a little bit more aware of B12, but that's not just for plant-based people. 40% of Americans are B12 deficient. So be aware, eat the kind of foods that have B12, or if you're worried, just supplement. Yeah. But that comes rarely. Um, uh, Omega-3, not at all. If you're eating a, a planned diet, not only are you, are you going to have enough Omega-3, you will have the right amount and the right type. What we should worry about, the narrative that should be pushed, the standard American diet, the SAD diet, is not only not deficient, but it's actually full of poisons for the brain. I mean, they've done studies on children, and we're talking about, we did a video on this, they're talking about um, uh, children having ADD, ADHD, and that's not your biggest problem. They saw children that were eating a certain kind of diet, and they were obese, and they had uh, uh, a cholesterol. They had white matter disease of the brain. Mm -hmm. The kind of disease that you see in you know people in their 70s and 80s if they're not healthy yeah. so we are actually damaging children's brains with the standard diet forget about lack of b12 or choline or this or that a whole food whole food plant-based diet eliminates all those poisons or significant limits and on top of that adds the variety especially if you're planning it mm -hmm. i'm not saying a plant-based diet that's not planned if you're only all you're eating is potatoes you're going to kill yourself I'm sorry, there might be a potato client there. I don't care that you're going to kill yourself. You have to have variety. You have to have plan. You have to be aware of your B12. You have to be aware of your omega-3. And if you are, that's by far the healthiest food for the brain. Uh, we've raised our children on this food from, very, from birth and they did well and they were on your show. The, we think that it's almost criminal that we're not feeding our children a whole food plant-based diet that not only gives them all the necessary foods, but keeps all those poisons away from their fast growing brains. Yeah. Do you recommend people take that blood test that is called the fatty acid profile to see where they are with their omega-3s? 
No, it's not recommended at all. Um, we know that when people uh, switch from, um, you know, just a standard diet to a plant-based diet, um, their omega-3 levels uh, do decrease if they're not planned properly. But again, like Dean said, with adding maybe two or three tablespoons of flax seeds or chia seeds to our meals on a daily basis and significantly lowering our sources of omega-6, which comes from processed foods that have a lot of bad fats, trans fatty acids, seed oils, etc., then what you do is you increase your omega-3 fatty acids and you decrease your omega-6 and you're not going to have any problems. And like we said earlier, you know, there are certain times during life when people need a little bit more. And in those situations, just an algae-based omega-3 fatty acid, but it's not for everyone. Everyone can actually get it from a wholesome diet. Um, Mindful muffins. Get this book and get the mindful muffins. It has a lot of flax seeds. And yeah, it, it's it's cheese. amazing. Yeah. So yeah, you'll like it. Um, just to show that how hard we work to make sure that this is not an overstatement, over extrapolation, exaggeration just to sell books. We've almost had seizures with the cover of this book. You know, you know <laughs> we're scientists. How are we going to put a cake on the cover? But they they convinced us that. Most people, when they talk about healthy food, they think deprivation, and you have to break that through that first wall of deprivation. So that that makes sense. And then we made this this table. Uh, you want to? Explain? It's a spectrum, yeah. So we so we included a spectrum, chef, and it's it's I don't know what page it is right now. Sixty eight. But you know, the green shows beneficial foods, the brown is neutral, and the red is harmful foods. And this is essentially just you know our extrapolation of the data. Um, and uh, we included a paragraph at the top of this spectrum, and I'm going to read it out to you so you can actually see that we're so self-critical. Um, and I quote here, this spectrum represents our extrapolation of the current research on nutrition and brain health. For us, it is not just about reflecting the science, but also speaking to the weight and the context of the science. This food spectrum can serve as a useful tool, but it is in no way perfectly representative of the complexity of nutrition. So take it for what it is, a general guide open to change with new data or more complex interpretations. And I think that's that's a beautiful way of stating what we know so far and what we will learn later on and how we can adjust our recommendations as information comes forward. Well, I don't see how there's going to be any deprivation. <laughs> <laughs> that's Old right. food, dark chocolate, orange pistachio truffles. So Those yes. great. Those you know, great. One of, I, I, when I've heard Dr. Esselstyn speak, he's talked about how when Young children, even under the age of 10, have died in car accidents and they've done autopsies. They've already found evidence of heart disease. Yeah. Do they also find evidence of brain disease in children that young <clears throat> under those circumstances? If they, are they looking for it? You were saying that yeah, earlier. Yeah, I said that uh, uh, earlier that when they look at children's brains, they found white matter disease in yeah. their brains. There are these white spots, <clears throat> and that's because of damage to the arteries in the brain. At, in 12-year-olds. Yeah, I mean, you're worried about ADD. I'm talking about the kind of vasovascular disease that you should see in, in stroke patients in children. And it's mostly because of food. And yeah. in fact significantly more because of food. Especially at that age, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's just crazy. It so is. here's a question from Randy who's watching live that I find is really interesting because I often present at a place called Rancho La Puerta in Tecate, Mexico. And one time I was sat at a table with Dr. David Perlmutter who wrote yes. Brain Brain. Yeah. And Rancho La Puerta is not vegan, but it's, it's, it's vegetarian. They do have a little fish, but it's very, very minimal or no oil because it's spa food and they're trying to keep the calories low. And so if you want oil, you actually have to ask for it because they don't serve it. And so I was seated next to him and I ordered some greens and he ordered some greens. I, at first, I didn't know who he was. And so he asked for oil and he said, would you like some? I said, no, I don't eat oil. And he goes, why? And then I started telling him and he goes, what's your cholesterol? I said, 99. He goes, oh, you're going to have Alzheimer's. Randy says, does a cholesterol level below a hundred harm the brain? Oh no, not at all. I don't, that, this data is, um, so if you, if you, you know, we're, we're beings that are confirmation bias driven. We love hearing good news about our bad habits. We search for good news about our bad habits. So if you do it that way, you're going to find a one-off paper in, in Zimbabwe or some, I'm not picking on Zimbabwe. Yeah, or, pick on a country. Uh, no, I shouldn't pick on a country. Uh, and, and, and in some place 
<clears throat> Zimbabwe is a great place, by the way. Um, a, a, a great uh, that that's written that if you eat aluminum, you're gonna have mu- incredible brain. One-off papers or a few papers, even meta-analyses, don't mean anything. Right now, there's a meta-analysis that came out that says that if you are on a keto diet, you're you're gonna have um, it's gonna be protection. When you look at that data, it is so flawed. Yeah. Some of the studies have two people in them. I mean, it's ridiculous just because you call it their meta-analysis. The data strongly shows that lower the fat, you do fine. Though the slight bit of nuance is significant lower cholesterol. I mean, we're talking about ways lower, artificially reduced by medication. And a couple of studies show that it increased your hemorrhagic stroke risk. But actually, that's not been reproduced. No. That's false. I'm just saying that just sort of because somebody in the audience probably read that. We go through the studies. Asha is a stroke specialist and researcher. I'm a uh, dementia specialist and researcher. We go through these data. The data by far supports lower cholesterol, better brain. Oh, absolutely. And they've even done specific studies on looking at midlife cholesterol levels and later life Alzheimer's disease. There was a study that was done in the Northern California, Northern California Kaiser Permanente study. Uh, almost 10,000 individuals followed for years, and they found that when uh, people had high cholesterol during their midlife, they increased their risk of Alzheimer's disease by 57%. They had a 57% higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease if they had high cholesterol. And even moderate high cholesterol, you know, the kind that doctors usually don't treat, they had a 23% increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease compared to people who had very low cholesterol levels. So we actually have objective evidence that the lower your cholesterol is, the lower your risk of Alzheimer's is and stroke as well. That is very good news. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we, we have lots of wonderful comments saying how wonderful you guys are and they're buying the book. So thank you guys. And Michelle says, do the shares eyes think that HRT will have a positive effect on Alzheimer's as we are aging? Mm-hmm. I heard that estrogen replacement can help delay dementia. And she purchased three books, one for her mom, one for her sister, and one for herself. Thank you. Uh, I hope that she also joined the group that, that will be taking her through the journey in, in April. Yeah. Um, so again, complexity. Uh, HRT is extremely important. Hormone replacement therapy is extremely important. But it appears the timing is important. Mm-hmm. When it was given too late, just like in heart disease, there seems to be a weaker relationship with cognitive health. When it was given, um, when I'm saying given, around perimenopausal perimon- time, right? When it was given at the right time, there seems to be a relationship. The studies on brain are not as robust as the studies on the heart, but it appears the relationship is the same. And given at the right time and the right combination seems to be beneficial for brain health. That's great, thank you. Now here, here's an interesting question, especially the way it's phrased, because I always think of Dr. Goldhammer who was on the show this weekend, who often says, just because something is less bad, doesn't mean it's good. Angela <laughs> says, quick clarification, please. Salt is worse than animal fats for vascular health? <clears throat> oh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, uh, so worse than is, is a three dimensional chess. Somebody who has high blood pressure salt may be worse for them. Mm -hmm. Others who have cholesterol problems and other problems, the meat may be worse for them. It it really is an injustice to break it down to such binary concepts. Mm. They're bad. They're bad. Um, But your situation and your disease and your state and your pathologies and your genetics play play important role. So just assume that they're both really bad um, and, and, uh, and, and reduce both of them. Great, thank you. So Mindy says, how much chia and flaxseed should you eat while pregnant to get what you need? And how much should you eat if you're not pregnant? Is there a recommended amount? Well, I think um, it depends again on how much processed food people eat. Let's assume that nobody, you know, your audience or we don't eat processed foods at all. Adding at least two tablespoons of chia seeds to your diet should be more than enough. It would give you more than enough omega-3 fatty acids for your brain. Um, but as far as pregnancy is concerned, again, that also depends on multiple different factors. Um, from the review study that we did, it seems that when pregnant women take a little more than the general population, it, it is actually beneficial for their health and also the baby's brain growth during that period, during the prenatal period. Um, so for transparency's sake, uh, let's just say that we are vegan for animals. 
we're vegan for the planet. As it happens, lo and behold, the science follows as well. But the science of fish is not there. There's evidence that people who eat fish especially, uh, seem to be some benefit for them. But we know for a fact that that's not the fish. It's the omega-3. So we say, why go through the middleman, which has you know all these toxins? By the way, the only two th toxins that we inconsistently check is mercury and lead, and maybe uh, PCBs, uh, PCBs now, but not 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 even not, even. not, even. not consistently in the. Clinic. But what about the thousands of other chemicals that are added into the water systems? that these fish concentrate, they're bioconcentrators. So we worry about multiple things. And, and the fact that well, it's not a healthy planet if you've completely destroyed the oceans of fish, which we do. Right, right. So we don't need the fish, we need omega-3. So having said that, just clarity and complexity, there are times that we need more omega-3. Mm -hmm. Pregnancy requires more omega-3. So if you need to get a supplement, an algae-based supplement, do so. The studies that we did on aging, especially cognitive aging, the dose has not been fully vetted, but it appears that the dose of omega-3 that we need, be it pill or otherwise, is more than we thought. So be aware of that. So have more of it. Um, uh, if it was up to Aisha, we would be having IVs of uh, chia and flaxseed, but, <laughs> but we can't. Uh, I, I refuse We're not that. at that age yet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but definitely more. It's complexity, yeah. but it's important. Mm -hmm. Omega-3 is important. You don't need to get it from fish. Uh, but be more aware of it. And if you need to supplement, by the way, we're not selling anything. Even this book, the proceeds go to a non-for-profit. So we don't have any vitamins or anything, but we think uh, be aware of the omega-3 content in children, pregnancy, aging brains. And there are some clinical trials that are being done. Uh, and I'm <clears> really <throat> excited that we'll have more information about this, you know, in specifics, uh, the specific dosage or the kind, et cetera. Uh, so more information is coming through. Well, we know that flaxseed has to be ground to be assimilated. Do chias have to be ground as well? No, not that we know of. I think it can easily be digested and the omega-3 or the alpha linoleic acid is easily available. Yeah, but flax, yeah, it kind of goes through you if you don't grind it. By the way, the, the conversion of ALA to EPA to DHA, I have to bring this up because other people will bring it up to you. Oh, it's not efficient. It's only 15%. Um, uh, it's not. It's as much as 8%. But guess what? That's fine. That's more than enough. Yeah. That 8% con conversion to EPA to DHA, if it is 8%, is, is more than enough. And if you lower your processed food and saturated fat, you're, that, that machine is going to become so efficient in conversion that, that, that meets more than your needs. Yeah. Well, eating fish to get your omega-3s is like eating beef to get your B12. It really makes no sense. Or, or drinking um, soda to get your water. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So can you sprout your flax and chia? Can you get the same benefit if, 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 if I'm willing to do that? Is that okay? And if so, what, what is the, how much would I have to eat to get the same benefit? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, sprouting actually, uh, you know, it, 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 it breaks down some of the tough texture and the, the fibrous coating and makes the micronutrients available. I am not sure how much of the sprouted seeds would be equivalent to the regular I'm monoseeds. Yeah, yeah, so I'm not going to make a statement about that. But yes, we, we all know that sprouting actually is really, really helpful to allow for these micronutrients to be activated. Great, because that's what I'd like to do, even with my beans, just because I got so excited. I had Doug Evans on the show and I got mm -hmm. the sprouting kit for my birthday. And it just mm -hmm. seems like it would be just a fun way to eat those things. Yes. yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I saw a question. Where did it go from? I, pr forgive me if I don't pr pronounce your name right. He's going to be on the show, actually. Is it Bullent or Bullient? And he wanted to know what you think about, was it Moringa and Tulsi? Those, I think I have that right. You ever heard of those? Oh, you're asking us? Yeah, Mar yeah, I'm asking you that. Yeah, because I don't know. In, in Tulsi? I'm not let, sure. let me find it because my, my little chat skipped. So I, uh, yeah. I, I will find <clears> it. <throat> so in the meantime, I'll ask another question. Why is it? I saw one from Randy. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so yes. Maybe you guys can play the guitar while you're doing that because we know that because <laughs> uh, I heard that's very good for you to play a musical. Oh, absolutely. Aisha yeah. is a, as a, as a cook and she's a professional singer too. As you wow. can see, 
I have no talents. She's got all the talents. I'm I'm just here for the looks and 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 uh, yeah. Uh, where can we he- where can we hear you and your daughter sing? I keep hearing what great singers you are, but I can't seem to find anything of you guys singing. They will. They we have will. To. Yeah, we we haven't. But they're you know we sang at the ACL and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine conference, uh, and and we uh, we uh, we actually perform for some charities and uh, for we sang at the Alzheimer's Association conference and uh, uh, we haven't really been working hard at it let's just put it that way but my daughter is amazing she's incredible her voice is just you're like a quadruple threat i mean brains beauty doctor chef singer i mean what what can i what can't you do (laughs) oh you're too kind you're too kind thank you so here it is could you please ask team shirzai about moringa and tulsi i don't know what those are i'm guessing they're herbs or supplements maybe. probably um tulsi i do recall yes i'm i'm not sure if there's any particular research uh, on that specific um spice or herb um but again you know spices and herbs in general like we said it are very very helpful but nobody has actually looked at that particular um herb for brain health okay. do you know if any i don't yeah i don't yeah Great. So Randy says, I'm starting to wonder about my memory. My father did have Alzheimer's at 80, but I'm having more and more things like telling myself to grab or do something. And I forget I'll be 65 on Monday. Mm. So, so our program is basically, of course, nutrition centered, but there are five components, neuro, uh, self-serving, N-E-U-R-O, N for nutrition, E for exercise, U for unwind or stress management. And that's a very important one because we focus on good stress and bad stress. R for restorative sleep. And and which is you have to go through those cycles, phases of sleep five, four to five times a night. And the only solution people keep giving individuals or our patients is medication. That's not the right way. There's there's a lot of, we're not against medicine, but long-term there has to be other things which is part of the program. And O, is incredibly important, which is optimizing mental activity. We did a meta-analysis in 2018, people can look at it. And when we look at all the data, three things stand out. Uh, um, um, Purpose, complexity, and challenge. So um, yes, whereas crossword puzzles and Sudoku is great, but more complex activities, like you said, learning a musical instrument and other things are incredibly important. But if you take all five of those elements and you incorporate them into your life, Now let's talk about exercise. One study, Harvard study, a brisk walk. We're not talking about something complex, a brisk walk, 25 minutes a day on a consistent basis, reduced chance of Alzheimer's by 45%. Just a brisk walk. That's the profound effect of exercise on brain health. Yeah, so it's not the brisk walk thing, but a kind of exercise that gets you tired and short of breath. Why? because it's the blood flow to the brain. It increases BDNF and GDNF into the brain. It, it, it normalizes um, um, your metabolism. So adding good nutrition, exercise, and all of that. Now to, your, to, your, uh, to the person that asked that question, as we get older, another thing that have, have, uh, happens is our focus is affected for two reasons. One is the, the first areas of the brain that are shrinking are focus centers. There are actually focus centers in the brain. And the second thing is, all the cumulative processes in life, the multitasking and everything, all that accumulates in almost like layers and layers of noise, right? So we, we were writing something about this. Focus is the gatekeeper of consciousness. Yeah. Focus is the gatekeeper of memory. <clears throat> and if you systematically work towards building focus by doing the kind of things we talk about, you will profoundly open up the gateway to memory, executive function, and everything else, as opposed to the other direction, which is as we get older, focus is narrowed, narrowed, narrowed. The areas of the brain that deal with focus shrink, 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 and then everything falls apart. Mm. So focusing on focus is critical, and it's part of the program. It's actually part of the book. Focusing on focus. And focusing on focus. I love that. Well, good, because I was going to ask you, Evelyn had a question about exercise, so thank you. Elizabeth says, what about languages for breath, breath, brain health? Yeah, it's amazing. Um, People who are bilingual or a polyglot, they actually have lower risk of cognitive decline. We have studies on that. And it makes sense. When you speak a language, it's not just one part of your brain. It's your interaction with an individual. It actually activates multiple parts of the brain. And that's the beauty of real life activities. 
you actually want to activate multiple parts of the brain and you build cognitive reserve when you do that. So yes, learning a new language is an excellent, excellent activity for the brain. And many of you in your audience know the studies that show that children that knew multiple languages, they had lesser chance of cognitive decline later in life. So yeah, building, uh, you know, or having a, a, a bank account, what we call cognitive reserve, mm -hmm of multiple languages or even two languages is incredibly protective. And what a great exercise for focus and attention, because every word that comes out of your mouth, you have to 100% pay attention to it and be creative enough to form a sentence, bring your emotions and your memory into it. It's a phenomenal activity. As if, as if I haven't made you sick enough with Aisha's talent, she knows five languages. And uh, when she gets angry at me, she curses me in <laughs> five languages. Imagine the focus. I don't curse. She, I'm, don't just, curse. I'm oh. just kidding. I'm just kidding. So which, which five, I'm curious, which five languages do you speak? Uh, English, obviously. Well, she sings in Hindi. Well, we grew up in India. My, my dad was, um, he worked for the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO. So, you know, people who work for FAO, they travel a lot. So we traveled quite a bit. And that's why I have a little bit of an accent because we lived in India for a long time. And my dad was a kind of a guy who would say, you just have to go to the regular school. I'm not going to get, you know, send you to a special school or something like an international school. So we went to local schools. We hung out with the kids. We, we learned the language. So I speak, um, uh, read and write Hindi. And then we lived in Italy. So we learned Italian there. And uh, so now I've, I've even forgotten. Oh yeah. And we lived in Kuwait for a while. So I was exposed to Arabic there. Farsi and Farsi because my grandfather, uh, my, my grandparents spoke Farsi and my mom is a linguist. She was a, she was a teacher and a linguist and she made sure that we learned the language very well. So I speak Farsi, I speak Hindi, I speak um, Italian, it's bad, not, not very good. I speak English, of course, because that's our primary language and a little bit of Arabic. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> wow. Uh, speaking of exercise, Faith said, is rebounding on a trampoline good for brain health? Oh, that's a good question. We don't know, but I would be worried. Yeah. Uh, so I say, I talk about this a lot. <clears throat> we're, beginning to be, we're beginning to know that the brain is more susceptible and resilient. So let's take both sides of that. Susceptible because it's a, if you ever hold a brain in your hand, it's not like this. This is hard rock. It's like a hard jello. The brain is like a hard jello. So, <clears throat> and, and, and it's encased in a bony structure sharp bony structure, especially the temporal lobe where the memory centers are in front of it. There's a bone in front of the lobe. There's a bone. And what, what, what it's floating in is not viscous fluid. It's like water, like fluid. So it's not like, it's not protecting it much. So we know that people who played soccer, for example, uh, who had the ball a lot, they had some cognitive effect, some, something like soccer. Imagine that. So I tell people be a little more protective. Although we don't have data on things like long distance running, where you're jumping all the time, or definitely we have data on boxing and all of that, that right. that's already proven. Right. But things like trampolines, if you're doing it on a regular basis, just be a little more aware. I'm saying that from personal extrapolation, take it for what it is. It's personal extrapolation of a neurologist, but it's extrapolation nonetheless. We don't have data, but I worry about activities that jar the brain a lot. That's, that's my personal worry. Um, that's the, yeah. That's interesting. So race car driving, probably not so great. <laughs> not really. Yeah. Especially if you're not good at it and you're hitting walls a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, Carolyn says, how much turmeric? Mm. Is it turmeric or turmeric? We always, it's turmeric, right? It, it's turmeric, yes. Yeah. yeah. And do you recommend each day? We well, at least, you know, at one fourth of a teaspoon or half a teaspoon if you can. Um, some people have kidney stones and some GI issues. They should be careful with it. Um, but for the rest of us, you know, at least, you know, uh, one fourth of a teaspoon per day is more than enough. Great. Well, here's a good question. How much forgetting things is actually just a normal process with aging? When, when do we worry? And how mm -hmm. do we even remember that we forgot if we, I mean, <laughs> I always wonder. It's good to assume, it's good not to worry about, about forgetting, but it's good to assume that you're at risk. <clears throat> what does that mean? So both of us had two grandparents each that died from Alzheimer's. So if I check my genes, now I forget things all the time and I attribute it to being busy. Sometimes even though we try to get multitasking out of our system and it's always one, one silo at a time, yeah. still multitasking takes over. So I attribute it to that. And I, but it, let's say I find out that I have the APOE4 gene. 
Now, every time I forget, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to attribute it to the gene and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I tell people, assume you have risk because we all do to different degrees and live life healthfully. And then you will actually significantly reduce risk because the genetic studies have shown that APOE4, which is the highest risk gene, right? If you have one gene from one parent, your risk is four times. If you have one gene from both parents, your risk is 12 times. But even there, 50% of people who have two genes never develop dementia. Why? Lifestyle. So don't worry about genes. Don't worry about if you have risk. Assume you have risk and then live life healthfully and you will eliminate or reduce risk profoundly. Right. Right. And, and these, you know, these forgetfulness, um, if, if they're not really affecting your life in a way where, yeah, you, you're forgetful and then you kind of resume and do your, your normal routine, then it's okay. We all have some forgetfulness that could be related to lack of sleep or just being overwhelmed or just having so much going on. But if they start affecting your lifestyle in a way where say, for example, you have difficulty keeping up with the bills or keeping up, you know, driving to less familiar places and you kind of get lost, or it becomes an impediment to your daily activities, that's when you need to get evaluated. We say have a very low threshold for getting evaluated for brain uh, health issues and for memory issues. Don't let it go to the point where it's almost too late for people to do anything about it. Um, and again, don't worry if you do have some some memory problems. I mean, I Dean leaves his jacket wherever we go. He leaves his jacket there because he gets busy talking to people. And, you know, I lose the keys all the time, but um, it, it doesn't really affect our life per se. I thought you threw me under the bus there for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, so, but I included myself too. Apparently, there's an app now where like you can find your keys really easily because I, yes. yes. I always wear my cell phone around my neck so that Good. I yeah. Yeah, or lose it but yeah. apparently that you can get some app where it, it it's like you can find your keys so yes yes, yes. yes. and they exactly. have those tiles that kind of make a noise you know like if you just stick it on something and I, I have i have someone stick on suck on dean so i don't lose him yeah <laughs> that's funny so brand a different randy says can brain atherosclerosis be reversed and jackie says can brain damage be reversed i think i know what you're going to say <clears throat> so let's talk about atherosclerosis um, reversal of vascular disease is quite is 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 a challenging question, mm -hmm. be it heart disease or other diseases. Reversing it is challenging, so um, we don't have much data on that. But stopping progression, which is even more important, because if you can ask that question, and if you're good, you're good. That means that we can stop it from progressing. That's what we need to focus on, and that definitely we can do that. Now, the second question is brain damage. It depends on what level. I mean, if, mm. if half a brain had a stroke, there's not much recovery from that. Yeah. If a person has fulminant Alzheimer's, meaning that the Alzheimer's is completely taken over, no, that's not going to reverse. There are some people that are making those kind of claims or have made those kind of claims. Those are inappropriate. That's, that's playing with people's hope. And we would never do it. We were asked, not to ask, but kind of hinted that if we said that in our book, that we would sell 2 million extra books we said, no way. That's, that's unethical. 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 So, so you can't reverse that. Point. But prior to that, even at the point of my, what's called mild cognitive impairment, where memory is affected, like I should describe where you're, it's affecting your life to some extent. Absolutely. It can be reversed study after study, just diet studies that show that um, a, a, a plant center diet reduced at that stage, 53% reduction in progression to Alzheimer's. I mean, that's remarkable. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, you can, re you can definitely halt disease and you can definitely reverse at the earlier stages. That's, a, that's incredible. So wait, I just saw, a oh yeah, here, this is interesting. Mary Lou says, what are the effects of sleep apnea on the brain? Oh, sleep apnea has a lot of negative effects on the brain. So sleep apnea, for those who don't know, is a condition where people stop breathing when they're sleeping. And it's because of some you know, disconnection between the uh, communication between the brain and the lungs. And what happens is our oxygen saturation or the level of oxygen goes down in our circulation. And when it goes down significantly to say, it's supposed to be like 100 or 99%, but if it goes down to say 80s or even 70s, that low oxygen level in our blood wakes us up. So you are never allowed to go through those deeper stages of sleep, which are important for two things. One, 
during those deeper stages of sleep, our memories get consolidated. It becomes solidified. It goes to the right part of the brain and it becomes a part of your memory. And the second thing that happens, which is incredibly important, is the brain cleanses itself. We have a special system called the glymphatic system that allows for the brain to get cleansed uh, from all the byproducts that is created during the day. And if people have sleep apnea and they keep waking up and never go to those deeper stages of sleep, there is accumulation of those byproducts and our memories are not consolidated, which increases the risk for Alzheimer's disease. In one study from uh, University of Florida, uh, they, they followed people who were untreated for sleep apnea, and these untreated sleep apnea cases had a 70% higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But on the contrary, if one wears their CPAP machine, if they get treatment for sleep apnea, their risk goes down significantly. There are two causes for sleep apnea. One is called central, one is peripheral. <clears throat> the one that's more common is peripheral. And peripheral is either because of obesity, which is the most common reason, or redundant tissue, which for that you need either surgery or some appliances. But if it's if it's obesity or excessive weight, going for to a whole food plant-based diet, losing some weight can significantly help without the need for a CPAP machine. Maybe initially you need CPAP machine because you don't want any time where you are lacking, you know, oxygen, but later it, gets, it can be weaned off. So a great majority of sleep apneas is as a result of uh, um, excessive weight that can uh, can be eliminated. Um, so that's that's the approach. That's funny. Somebody said, well, if you lose your keys and your cell phone at the same time, you're screwed. But that's why <laughs> I wear mine, so I never will lose it. Yeah, that's terrific. Kathleen says, but she has a really hard time learning languages and playing an instrument. Is there something else she can do to boost her brain health? Yeah, I would, uh, I would say, you know, whatever seems challenging and fun for you. At the end of the day, whatever activity that you can do on a regular basis is the best one for you. But again, I think there are three things that are very important about activities. It has to be challenging, it has to be complex, and it has to be connected with a purpose in life. And that purpose, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be huge, like Dean always says. It could be very, you know, very small, very short term. Say, for example, I want to draw a painting or I want to be really good at this particular game. Having a purpose and that end goal can actually create a vector where you can create steps of activities towards that vector, towards that goal. Uh, studies have shown that people who retire, who, have, who are cognitively active, and they retired and for several years they didn't do anything they just lay down on a beach or something they had the greatest decline in mm -hmm. cognitive function mm -hmm. so even more than anything else of the neuro cognitive activity seems to be the most protective the nun studies showed this these nuns that dedicated their life well nuns do the same things right but they they, they captured their diaries as well and then they found a group of nuns after death when they looked at the brain biopsies which they had agreed upon that they had significant pathology in their brain, but yet they never manifested disease, brain disease when, when they were alive. And others who had very little pathology, but they were full Alzheimer's cases. So what was the difference? Well, the difference was when they looked at their diaries, the ones that had more complex language, more vocabulary, were more, more well-read, more active, more social, were protected in spite of the pathology. Mm -hmm. So cognitive activity is critical. What kind? Build around your purpose. Take classes. You know, if you're older, take, I mean, I've, we are per perpetual students. You know, people say we have more degrees than a thermostat. We're gonna continue, not because of degrees, because we love learning. So take classes that you never thought, you know, I hated histology. Now I'm taking art history, you know, I love art, you know, things of that nature. And there's so many free classes and free universities out there that yeah. people can sign up to. Take dance classes. I mean, Ooh. that might be dangerous for me and you've taken, you, know, <laughs> you might get head trauma, but dance <laughs> classes or, or new musical instrument, languages, run a company, run a group, book club, um, a card group, you know, especially if it's a thought uh, card games that are, you know, mind challenging. Uh, you know, all these are activities that are multifaceted, which means they involve multiple domains of the brain. But at the same time as serving your purpose, which means that it keeps pulling you along and gives you joy. And the challenge part is you have to keep pushing it to the next level. Let's say guitar. If you're playing guitar and if it's four chord song, one song, after a while it becomes the same thing. So you're not pushing the brain. Learn another song. Learn five chords. You know, things of that nature. Yeah. 
That's neat. Seema says, are there tests that we could or should take to assess our brain health? Um, yes, there are uh, some tests that one can do. Um, and, and it's usually done when people go to a neurologist or their doctors with some complaints of um, cognitive impairment or memory problems. Um, there are neuropsychological tests. There are imaging like MRIs and CT scans. Um, but we actually have um, an, an app available that can ascertain how your lifestyle risk factors can affect your brain function. So, you know, people can actually get access to that as well. And that kind of gives them an idea of where they are in that journey towards better brain health. That's if they cool. sign up to that course. Yeah. yeah, that is terrific. So here's a very sciencey question from math. Okay. Matt, are dietary nitrates from greens and vegetables via the nitrate nitric nitric oxide pathway beneficial for vascularizing areas of the brain and neuroplasticity. <clears throat> so the same studies that Dr. Esselstyn and others have done where nitric oxide is actually vasodilator, opens up the vessels, the brain is no different. Well, there are some differences in the brain vasculature as far as the wall lining and the brain bl blood brain barrier and all of that. But as far as it's vasodilation and everything, we believe it's the same thing. So yes, the nitrates that you get from foods are beneficial or the nitrates that are released as well as a result of getting, eating out healthy foods are beneficial in vasodilating. Now, somebody did the math and of course this is extrapolation. It's not a real, real number, but it's a pretty good extrapolation that the brain, if you take these little small capillaries that go to every neuron, if you line them up end to end, it's as much as 400 miles of vasculature. So it's a, Every disease in the brain is a vascular disease before anything else. As much as people want to make it sound it's something else, for, no, it's vascular disease. So the same vascular risk factors that increase damage to the vessels anywhere else actually do so exponentially more for the brain. And anything that benefits those vessels, whether it's vasodilation or, or, or um, some new information that we're getting from the um, uh, gut-brain axis um, that, that, that help these vessels is going to profoundly help brain vessel, uh, brain, uh, uh, brain states later on in life. That's terrific. So Jan says, what about post COVID neurological issues? Are they reversible? Oh. Will the neuro nine help? So yes, the post COVID brain issues are becoming a very, very prominent, uh, uh thing in the clinic. And we're seeing a lot of individuals come in with complaints of having cognitive impairments some neuropathies and just some lethargy, but mostly cognitive impairment, lack of focus and attention being the most uh, specific aspect of cognition that is affected. Uh, we're learning more about it. I'm, I'm, I'm actually not going to make a huge statement to say mm -hmm. that, you know, our, our neuro plan will, will be beneficial for it. But uh, we know that these stem from just a slew of different processes, which include inflammation in the brain. Um, so we're, we're learning more about it, but obviously having a healthy lifestyle and improving metabolic factors such as blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, glucose metabolism can give the brain the right environment for it to, to function better and to improve as we move forward. But, you know, we're in the process of getting more and more information mm -hmm. and there's a lot of research going on and we'd be happy to um, update you on that. That's great. Linda says, I have diverticulitis and I can't eat seeds or nuts. What do you recommend to replace that? They can't even eat them when they're ground so finely from flax or chia? Um, I think it should be fine if they're ground really well, but if they can't, then that's okay. I mean, they could probably just get most of their nutrients from other things, greens, beans, and all the other things. There are going to be some limitations. All of us are not going to be able to eat most of the foods that are healthful for the brain. But, you know, if you modify and if you eat more of one thing and not the other, I think you should be all right. So say, for example, if you can't eat nuts and seeds, well, first of all, see if you can actually just pulverize them and make it into a powder and add it to, say, your dressings or to your soups. But if you can't do that, then you should just rely on some of the other food products. Great. What is the name of your app called? Oh, um, so um, so they can actually get access to the app and all the bonuses on our website. Chef, should I go ahead and just... Right. Well, uh, what I've been doing is I've been posting it in the chat and I'm going to keep it in the show notes. I've posted it several times. So, all right. But I guess they're just asking what the name is when they... Oh, it's called the Neuro app. The Neuro Plan app. The Neuro Plan app, sorry. Neuro, N-E-U-R-O, Plan app. 
And um, yeah, they can actually get access to it from our website. And I put a link in there for you. Thank you so much. And people keep asking about insulin resistance in the brain. Right. <clears throat> so we did a paper with NHANES, which is a nationwide database. It's a very an incredible database, 33,000 people, which are nationally representative. And, and these poor people have to even give like fat samples. I mean, the, the, they, 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 they're really doing a lot of service for, for the nation. <clears throat> and we looked at, we actually excluded diabetics and looked at pre-diabetics and insulin resistance. Um, the methodology we used uh, is in the paper. And what we found was that even insulin resistance or pre-diabetics had a lower cognitive state. So that's why we say be extra aware of your those, those values. Some of the things we ask people to check on a regular basis, hemoglobin A1C, know your glucose status, know your lipid status, know your B vitamin status, vitamin D status, things of that nature, because we can't be magical. In our population, we live in California, even in the sunny California, Southern California. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, about 15% of our population are vitamin D deficient. Right. And vitamin D's association with the brain has been strongly identified, whether it's, you know, MS and other things as well. So be aware of those levels. And, and, and the first step is not to supplement. The first step is why? Why do you have B12 deficiency? Is it because you're taking some acid blocker that's then affecting the, you know, the B12 absorption or what else? So I remedy that. But then if, if deficient and there's no way to rectify, then take a supplement. So that's that's the approach. That's amazing. Well, I've kept you guys long enough. We so appreciate your time. And guys, the book came out today. If you're going to get it, just get it today. You know you want it. And it really helps authors out when you get it early or you know before or today or at least the first week. And all those bonuses sound incredible. So, I mean, that sounds great to get to work with you for a month just because you bought your book. That's amazing. No, we, we appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. We, um, like, like Dean said earlier, for us, this is a, this is a, you know, a purpose in life to disperse this message of hope and to empower people to take care of their own brain health and not get to the point where it's, you know, it's almost too late. And we've seen it in our grandparents and our lovely patients. And there's so much that we can do in our communities to prevent this devastating disease and a lot of other diseases of the brain as well. So thank you for allowing us to speak about this. Are you kidding? It's my pleasure. And I wish you a, a huge bestseller with this book. And if you ever want to come out and demonstrate a recipe, we would absolutely 100%. love it. 100%. Yeah, you've got some great ones in there. There was a, a cauliflower rice dish that I tried and a roasted carrot salad dressing. So thank you so much for really your passion and for all the work that you do to get people's brains healthy or not sick in the first place. Thank you so much for everything you do. Thank oh, you. Oh my God, my pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my, oh, my guest is Melissa Alexandria. She's a very well-known YouTuber. Thanks so much, Team Shazai. Thank it's you. our pleasure. Thank you for having us. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye, you everyone. for joining.